He'll give the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. With five seconds, he's going to throw it. Howard leaps. He has it. Touchdown, Carolina. Back from the dead to tie the game with two seconds to go. There is a flag down. But holy smokes. Two and four in overtime games. Carolina one and three here from under center. Give off to Greg Little. Little pulls away. Little is going to score. Carolina wins. Snap back, spot down. The kick is cleanly away. It is good. And it's Parker <laughs> with yes, a sir. 54 yard field goal. And how about them Tar Heels? They do it. Possible win. Snap. Spot. Kick away. High enough. Long enough. It's good. It's good. Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Hunter Burns. In his end zone. The punt. Very high. Switzer will have room to return it. He feels it at the 40. Coming near side. Switzer at the 50. Switzer, 45, cuts back at the 40, 35, breaks the tackle at the 30, still on his feet. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Ryan Switzer for six. He is doing his best Giovanni Bernard impression. Ryan Switzer again. Bernard fields it at the 26, heading to the far side. Gio at the 35, Gio, he's at the 50, no he's not, yes he is, Gio, he's gonna take it for a touchdown, are you kidding me? What's going on guys, it's the Heel Tough Vlog Podcast, Anthony Pagnata, Josh Marlowe here with you guys on a Wednesday night as we get ready to recap Carolina's win over the camel fighting, excuse me, Campbell fighting camels. I knew I was going to do that at some point. Uh, 59 to 7 victory. We'll break that down in depth for you guys uh, coming up here. Uh, we also have to talk about Carolina landing a commitment during uh, that game. Uh, the 2024 four, uh, three star defensive lineman Leroy Jackson commits to Carolina during the game. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the player that Carolina is getting. I also have a question that I got to ask Josh about it um, that I think is an interesting angle to this commitment that you don't really see with a lot of other guys. Uh, also, we have to talk about Drake May. He spoke to the media yesterday. He was given the opportunity on Monday to walk with the seniors. Is he going to take that opportunity? And also, little hint at his future, at least where it stands at this point, at the end of – uh, the audio uh, that we'll play for you. So make sure that you guys stick around uh, for all of that. But we do have to start by uh, talking a about a, a somber note that came in to Carolina football earlier this week on Monday, and that is that former Tar Heel head coach and defensive coordinator Carl Torbush, he passed away earlier this week at the age of 72. This was revealed during East Tennessee's media availability on Monday afternoon. Torbush, a key member of Mac Brown's staff during his first stint in Chapel Hill, actually was the only member of Mac Brown's staff during that time that stayed for all 10 years of Mac Brown's uh, first tenure here, was with him from 1988 to 97. Uh, after Mac Brown hired him away from Louisiana Tech, uh, where he went three and eight in his first year as a head coach at the college level. Uh, he engineered some great defenses in his time at Carolina, really was able to build things up. Uh, and it all peaked in 1996 when he had the best statistical defense in the modern era for Carolina football. There is a defense back in the uh, mid 40s, uh, mid to late 40s that allowed 8.6 points per game. Uh, also a defense in the uh, early 1920s that allowed uh, seven points per game, which believe it or not, back in that time actually wasn't all that great. It was actually middle of the road in the country. Uh, but when you talk about the modern era of football, when things really started to um, become more offensive, uh, I mean, this is this is as dominant as it gets. 9.2 points per game, which was easily first in the country during that 1996 season. 
and 20 uh, at just 248.2 yards per game allowed. Uh, they did not allow more than 20 points in a game that entire season. Um, just an absolutely dominant group. You talk about some of the guys that were on that those defenses that he helped recruit, especially in the late 90s, Dre Bly, Brian Simmons, Greg Ellis, uh, it's even some of the guys that were uh, earlier that uh, even if he didn't recruit, I know Dwight Hollier was the guy that uh, was commenting on social media how impactful uh, Coach Torbush was for him. Uh, and then, of course, Julius Peppers. He brings him in, uh, and he played under him uh, when he was a head coach. So uh, just a, a great job on the field in terms of his coaching and what he was able to do with Carolina defensively. Really, things have not been the same ever since then. Butch Davis came about as close as we've seen since, but nothing has been as dominant as the defenses that Carl Torbush has had during that time. And then when you go to his time as the head coach of the Tar Heels, you know, of course, he takes over at the conclusion of the 1997 regular season, uh, coaches the team in the 1998 Gator Bowl against Virginia Tech to a 42-3 to blowout victory. Uh, that was really the high point of his head coaching career, though, as he would coach the team for the next three seasons, 98 through 2000, uh, and only posted a 16-18 and record during that time. He would be fired at the end of the 2000 season after a six and five year after that he would go on to uh, coach as a defensive coordinator at Alabama, Texas A&M, Mississippi state and Kansas in different sense. He would also coach uh, Liberty as a linebackers coach before eventually landing at East Tennessee state uh, to help revive their program that had been dormant since 2003 lands there in 2013 eventually brings them back onto the field in 2015, coaches them through 2017, uh, and does post a an 11 and 12 record uh, or 11 and 22 record, excuse me, uh, and closes out his career uh, with a 31 and 48 record at the college level. So when you look at Forbush, I mean, really just one of the most dominant uh, defensive coordinators that Carolina has ever had. Um, the amount of talent that he assembled, guys that, you know, he brought in that were really talented, but he really took their, them to a completely different level. Um, I, I think he's a legend and he's someone that Carolina fans, you know, it's 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 somber to think about the fact that he passed away, especially uh, with how young he really is. But at the same time, I mean, what a legacy he leaves behind at Carolina. Yeah, I mean um... – Without a Mac Brown doesn't build the type of program he built the first time around. Um, you know, and when he took over as a head coach, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, but he kept the program afloat when when you're losing a dude like Mac Brown and what he had built, Carolina could have easily went back into being irrelevant uh football wise. Um that later happened really under John Bunning, but um you, you know, he he, he was the architect. He was the mastermind behind the program reaching national prominence in the 90s um, and really gave this team and this program a chance to legitimately compete for ACC and national championships, um, and, you know, in and, 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 and those back-to-back -back years. And so when, when you talk about Mac Brown 1.0, you got to mention Carl Torbush because – he kind of was to, to Mac Brown what Bill Guthridge was to, to Dean Smith on the basketball side of things, that you know, he was a loyal companion, um, and, and he really helped elevate the program to heights that we have never seen before and, frankly, haven't seen since. I think that's, uh, that's, that's about as good as we can say. We, of course, uh, give our pr thoughts and prayers to uh, Coach Torbush, uh, the family, and everything uh, during this difficult time. Let's move on uh, to the game that Carolina played on Saturday against the Campbell Fighting Camels in Keenan Stadium. And look, the Tar Heels in this one uh, got off to a little bit of a slow start. It was a little scary out of the gate. Uh, it looked like, you know, end of the first quarter, game tied at seven. Okay, this is not quite where we thought we would be. Uh, driving in the uh, middle of the second quarter, Campbell's driving the field. Chance to tie the game at 14. Okay, what is going on here? Uh, but a missed field goal by Cam Campbell on that drive really sort of turned the game. Uh, Carolina then just races away from them. 
you know, the, you really got to give them a lot of credit. Um, you know, the team scores 14 points in uh, a two minute and nine second span to expand, extend the lead to 28 to seven right before halftime. They actually get the ball back right before halftime. Uh, should have gone into the half 31 to seven uh, after an interception, first career interception for Marcus Allen. Um, Carolina then extended the lead to 45 to seven in the third quarter. It eventually allows the backups to enter the game. So they, they eventually got where they wanted to go, but I would imagine, I mean, I was in the stadium and I, 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 you know, me, of course, myself being a fan that has seen, you know, watched this program for a while, thought to himself, oh my gosh, there is no way that this is actually going to happen. We've seen it before. The one that comes to mind for me against an FCS opponent, there's a couple of them, really. Um, you had the game against Liberty before Liberty was a uh, an FC, FBS school. Um, when Carolina played them back in 2014, a year where people were excited heading into the season after the way they finished in 2013, and you were thinking, okay, uh, why are we struggling against this team? And also, there was a game, I don't remember the exact year, but there was a game under Butch Davis where Carolina struggled with McNeese State, and I was sitting there saying to myself, is this going to be one of those games? Is this team really going to let what happened against Virginia and Georgia Tech extend into a game against Campbell. But you got to give these guys a lot of credit, give the coaching staff credit, but really give the, the players credit for standing up and eventually finding their groove again and racing away the way they should have against Campbell. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much credit you should give them because you do what you were supposed to do at home against an inferior opponent. Like it was supposed to look the way that it looked. Um, from the second quarter on. And so I think we should have expected them to maybe sleepwalk through the first quarter um, just because there's going to be that hangover effect after back-to-back -back losses. But once they kind of settled into the game, their talent, their depth, all that kind of took over and, and it, it was it was on display. And I think more so you got to give Campbell a lot of credit because, you know, they came in ready to fight and they mm -hmm. came in – and they made Carolina earn it for the first quarter, quarter and a half or so before, you know, their dudes just were, were, were give out. So um, the, the way that Drake may look, the way that Amari and Hampton look, that's how it was supposed to look. Um, and, and, and so now you got to hope that, that you use that as a reset for the rest of the season um, because Saturday was – I mean, the, the, you, the, the most important thing was you guaranteed yourself a winning season. Like now, you can't you can't have a losing season. And when you were six and two and after coming off the back to back losses, that was starting to come somewhat into question. So Carolina was able to put that to bed on Saturday afternoon. Yeah, you you avoid running into another season like twenty twenty one, where you had one of the greatest quarterbacks at that time, the greatest quarterback in the history of your program. And you somehow finished six and seven before you knew he was going to depart for the NFL. That's not what's going to happen here with Drake May. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more at the end about what exactly this means for Carolina's confidence and everything like that. Um, but you, you mentioned Amari and Hampton and Drake May in there. Let's talk about them real quick. Um, but we'll, we'll start with Amari and Hampton, who I, I think just continues to show you why Carolina needs to lean on him. I know you've got one of the best quarterbacks in the entire country, but we've talked about this so often. Phil Longo's offenses, Chip Lindsey's offense now, these offenses are at their best when they are using the running game to open up the passing game. We've seen it so many times. And right now, you, you've got a guy in that backfield that is special. Last year, we saw what a freshman running back it, what, what happens to freshman running backs at times? You get off to a hot start, but then all of a sudden the college game starts to catch up to you a little bit. He wasn't nearly as decisive as he probably needed to be. It, it, you know, there, there were things that he wasn't able to do that he did early in the year when he got off to a good start against uh, some of the, uh, you know, non-power conference teams uh, that once they got in conference, was taken away from him. But this year, you could tell that he did a great job in the offseason. And now, th this dude is really one of the most dominant players uh, in the country at his position group. 
Uh, remains top 10 in the country in rushing yards, rushing touchdowns, scrimmage yards, and scrimmage touchdowns with a tremendous performance. 144 rushing yards, two touchdowns on the ground in this game. I, I, he, I mean, he has been fantastic, was fantastic again in this game. And I think right now, there is a legitimate case for him with what he is doing at, right on the ground and even catching the ball out of the backfield. I mean, this dude, I think, is right in the thick of not only being a possible ACC player of the year candidate at the end of the season, but a guy that could be right in the running for the Doak Walker Award if enough things break right down the stretch of the season. And if he keeps up this production the final three games, it's it's going to be really hard to argue. Um, I think Blake Cora maybe is the more, you know, I would say he's the best running back in, in, in college football, the running back from Michigan. But what 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 Amarin Hampton is doing is for Carolina, for uh, for Carolina is, is historic. Um, and, and he's really putting his name in the same breath as some of the all time greats to ever be a running back at Carolina. You know, Javante Williams, Giovanni Bernard, those types of guys who put up big type of seasons. Elijah Hood had the big year back in 2015 and so um it was good to see him have a big day and also not have to take the 25 30 carries to uh, to really get there because i think that's the thing you got to worry about with him as much as they've had to rely on him and rightfully so is his body going to be ready to hold up over the course of 12 games we're going to find out in the next couple weeks but uh he's been a lot of fun to watch and it just wasn't fair to Campbell that they had to try to tackle him because they had nobody on their roster that was really up to the task. Well, I mean, he he showed you what we saw coming out of high school from him and the reason that we compared him to Javante Williams. There were times where he had to run through guys and was just dragging players. Uh, he did it on his second touchdown. His first touchdown of the day, he literally just races away from everybody. Top speed, he hit 20.2 miles per hour. So – this is, this is what you like so much about him is there's the mix of speed and power. Um, as you said, you know, he's a guy that you do kind of worry a little bit about him wearing down. But I got to be honest, I don't really – I'm not that concerned about that. I know it's it's a different level. This dude came from a high school in, in Cleveland High School where he, he played his high school football and was dominant at – where he ran the ball, I mean, it was 35, 40 times a game. Like, this was – they used him like a bell cow, um, if I've ever seen it. So, he's used to handling this type of load. Carolina's not going to probably have him carry the ball 40 times in a game. I mean, look, if it's if it's working and they need to use him 40 times in a game, go ahead. Um, but he really does look the part of just a dominant back um, that Carolina hasn't really seen – uh, you know, since Javante Williams, yeah, they had and and Michael Carter, uh, yeah, they had Ty Chandler, uh, who had a really good year, but it wasn't on this level. And this guy, I think, you know, to be fair to Javante Williams and Michael Carter, if they had to do it, they probably could have reached the numbers that Elijah Hood did. This guy's going to probably get right around the same type of numbers that Elijah Hood did in 2015, um, which is remarkable. Uh, so I I, I think. I mean, this, the, the, I think this offense right now, you know, with him playing the way that he is, and then, you know, you look at the way Drake May's playing, um, you know, reached 20 touchdowns on the season, which is right up there near the top of the country so far this year. Um, and it, an incredibly efficient performance from him in this game. I mean, this, this is the type of performance that Carolina wants from their starting quarterback as often as they can get. Um, I mean, 310 yards four touchdowns, um, and, and I, I mean, to do it on just 16 completions is amazing. Like, this guy is feeling it right now, um, but he knows, look, I have to make the most of the opportunities that I have out there because right now the way this, they are running the ball, they're not wanting to stand back there and just go air raid. Uh, but he, I mean, he is playing tremendous football right now, and I think – Look, there's some really good players in the ACC. Jordan Travis will be right up there, um, you know, I, I, as well as you know a couple other guys. Uh, especially, you know, I know Jawar Jordan, the running back from Louisville, will be up there as well. Maybe their quarterback Jack Plummer. But I think both him and Hampton, I, I think they've got a legitimate chance, you know, to let this thing play out. I think both of them 
probably have a chance to be ACC Player of the Year as of right now. Yeah, I mean, I think Carolina's got to make the ACC title game. I think, I think Jordan Travis maybe already just locked up that award, just given what he's done for Florida State, quarterback, power program, um, national brand. And if he continues to produce without all of his dudes, because his whole entire receiving core is basically hurt, it's going to be hard to not give him that award. But if Drake puts up the type of numbers he's put up, and even in the losses, but those losses turn to wins, and Carolina gets the help that they're going to need to get to Charlotte, it's hard to envision that help coming with the way Louisville just pounded really good football teams the last couple of weeks. It's going to be hard not to give him that award. Um, so he's been fantastic. Uh, he's really overcome what was a you know up and down start to the season with with some with some turnover issues. He's really cleaned that up. Um, he's among the nation's leader in touchdown passes, up there in yards. Uh, the deep ball is, is it looks as good as it, as it ever has. So um, he's rounded into form, and he's given Carolina a chance every week to win. It's just been the defense hasn't done their part as we've grown accustomed to the last 10 years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, the defense did their part the other day, but it took them a little while, um, and eventually they were able to find their stride. But, uh, you know, I, I think – Right now, you're, you're just hoping that this offense, especially with where the running game is at, um, and, and, and now you couple that with the way that May's playing, this is an offense that can score in the 40s in just about every game because, uh, I mean, it, I know these offenses you're getting ready to face aren't that great, but we saw the offenses at the end of last year that Carolina faced that weren't that great and still were able to put up points. So, yeah, at this point, that's that's probably the expectation for this offense – every time they go out there, which is sad, but it's ultimately the state of reality that we're in. Let's go to his backup quarterback real quick. Um, and, and this, you know, we'll, we'll talk about both sides of the ball here with some of the young guys, but Connor Harrell, I, I think, was the guy that stood out the most. Um, we've talked so much about what, you know, it, we, we did it mostly during fall camp and now, you know, we haven't talked about him a lot now, but there's been some times where people have brought up, especially last week, there was a report that Michael Pratt, uh, who is the starting quarterback at Tulane right now, which has uh, arguably been over the past two years, the best group of five team in the country. Um, they have a chance to go back to a New Year's Six Bowl game again this year, uh, that he could potentially enter the transfer portal, look to go to a power conference team this offseason. Uh, Carolina fans, a couple of them brought up, is this a possibility with Drake looking like he could possibly move on, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. But, uh, you know, Connor Harrell is kind of the guy that a lot of people have pushed onto the back burner and said, okay, Carolina is going to need to bring in a transfer quarterback. Well, on Saturday, Connor Harrell showed that, yeah, you may need to bring in a transfer quarterback, but that doesn't mean that I'm going away. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to put up a fight next offseason if Drake May is, in fact, gone. Four for four, 71 yards, and a touchdown. The touchdown was an unbelievable touch pass on a deep throw to Chris Culliver. I mean, drop this thing in a bucket. That was one of the best deep throws that you're going to see from a Tar Heel quarterback. It was fantastic. Uh, two, uh, two carries on the ground, 61 yards, and a touchdown. Remember I told you just a few minutes ago about Amari and Hampton reaching 20.2 miles per hour. Connor Harrell reached 21.1 miles per hour on his uh, quarterback run, which was the fifth fastest speed of any player that played in college football uh, the other day, according to real stats, um, which is just insane to see him reach that speed. So he kind of showed you a little bit of what Carolina saw when they brought him in. Um, he's got that big arm. Uh, he, he's going to be able to do some things on the ground for you. I thought it was a great showing the other day for Connor Harrell and shows that he's going to be a guy that that is going to be a factor in the battle to replace Drake May whenever that is. I mean, you got to take what he did with a grain of salt given the competition level, but I've never operated as if he wasn't going to be the guy going into next year anyway, because I think the one thing that we've come to expect under Mac Brown 2.0 is Carolina is going to get good quarterback play. Um, no matter who's that quarterback, you got it with Sam Howell. Um, I think if 
Carolina would have transitioned from Howell to Jacoby Criswell. I think Jacoby Criswell would have been a very good quarterback, which you go to Drake May. And so if, if Connor Harrell ends up being the guy, I, I think he's going to be a dude that's going to make a lot of plays and could be the next the next guy in your in your quarterback lineage that has been vastly improved since Mac Brown returned for a second stint. So, um, you know, I'd love to see, you know, him do it against a power five opponent because I think that would really just further instill your belief in him and maybe make it easier for Carolina not to go get in the portal this upcoming offseason to bring a quarterback in. Um, I don't see that happening. I don't I don't think Carolina's blowing out any of their opponents to, to finish the, the regular season. But, you know, as for me, I, I've always thought he was going to be the next guy in line, and you could see why with some of the plays he made on Saturday. Yeah, I, I, I've – I mean, look, I have always thought they're probably going to bring in somebody else to compete with him because – I mean, the other that really it, it was based on what we'd seen from him in some of the spring games and everything like that. I mean, he hadn't really shown us a whole lot. This was his first ever game action, and I thought he looked really good. The one thing I will say, yeah, the level of competition, um, you do, you know, you kind of question, but he was going up against the same guys that the first team offense did. Campbell never took their starters out on either side of the ball. They left them in there the entire game, which was a, an interesting move. Um, you know, I think it's a good one probably for Mike Minner and, and his coaching staff because it uh, it sort of shows some of his guys that, hey, look, whenever they did make plays, you made plays against FBS competition. You can make them against FCS competition. Maybe it's a confidence builder for their guys. But, I mean, he, he was making the plays against guys that have been in there the entire game. So I think you got to give him some credit for that. Um, you know, you, if, if you could see him in there against Power 5 competition, yeah, I guess that'd be – Good, but the thing is, is I mean, you'd be playing backups. Like, I, I mean, I don't really know how much better that is than playing starters at the FCS level. To be honest they're, with you, they're they're better players than FCS players. I I mean, how much better? Some of these freshman guys that you're gonna like, there are some guys that are 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 backups on defense. Do you really think they're better than FCS starters right now? I mean, I, mean, I would I would I would I would like to think so. Um, if not, that's a problem. Like. I mean, it's just, it's just the nature. Like, we knew going in, like, you can't really – you just can't really take a whole lot from what you did the other night. Like, you beat a, you beat an FCS opponent by 52 points. Like, that's that's what it was supposed to look like. And, yeah, you were playing starters that were worn down by the time you entered the ball game. Like, they weren't fresh. So, like, that, that, that plays a factor into it. So, I mean, yeah. Have you seen the other quarterbacks, though, that have come in at times? Like, Jacoby Criswell came in against Western Carolina – a couple times in his career, and he was not good against them at all. So first action for Connor Harrell against somebody that's not his own teammates, I mean, I'm not saying that you should crown the dude as a Hall of Famer. He's not going to be a Ring of Honor guy. But at the same time, like, I mean, yeah, look, no, I mean, like, I, mean, like I said, and I, I think he stepped I, up. I, I think he showed you why he's going to be, you know, in my opinion, he's going to be the quarterback next year for the team. But, like, I wasn't sitting there ooing and aahing over what he did against, you know, worn down FCS starters. That's that's all that's all I'm saying. So that, I mean, you go over to the defensive side of the ball. Um, I, I mean, I don't know how much you were excited by any of the guys that were doing playing there, but um, I mean, for me, like Amari Campbell, I thought was outstanding. I think you saw that there there is definitely something there. Now for him. You know, to his defense, as opposed to Connor Harrell, he was in there almost the entire game. He was in there, I think it was like the first or second drive, he was out there for Power Eccles. Not sure why. Don't know if Power Eccles got banged up and they took him off the field real quick. But he was out there with Cedric Gray, and he was making plays early in the game. You can see that there is something there. We've seen him out there at other times during the year. I've been pretty encouraged with what I've seen from him. And I think he was really the guy that stood out the most to me. But there – you know, there were some other guys. A lot of guys got opportunities. I think it was 83 overall players on the team got a chance. But, you know, specifically defensively, I thought it was him. And then later in the game, I really liked what I saw from Tyler Thompson once he got in there. Again, playing against guys, you know, the, the same guys that the starters were going up against, played against their – he was playing off the left edge for Carolina. Technically, I guess, I guess the right edge for Carolina – uh, against the right tackle, Taylor McClellan, who was their best offensive lineman coming into the game. Um, and, and, I mean, he 
honestly looked better than some of Carolina's starters against them. Now, again, it's late in the game. Guys have gotten worn down. But I thought you saw some encouraging things from some of these guys um, that I, I think you can take away. I mean, it's hard to really say that this means they're automatically going to be good players. But these are the types of things you want to see. You want to see some of these guys that stand out um, in these types of games when they get the opportunity. And to me, those were the two guys that stuck out on that side of the ball. It helps build clarity going into the offseason because you have some tape to grade some of these players on and evaluate them. And you talk about building depth. You build depth. Yes, you do it in training camp with your position battles. But the really good teams build depth by blowing people out and getting a chance to play their backup dudes significant minutes. And Carolina did that in the beginning of the year where you were winning five of your first six games by double digits. So you got to build a little bit of depth. Clemson played a game earlier this year where they played like 111 dudes, which I don't even know how mathematically that's even possible. But that's all the walk ons. They, they have so many that want to be a part of the program. So, you, you know, like that, that's what I looked at it was that you got a chance to see some dudes that you, you, if, if you're really going to take the next step defensively, you're going to need some of these guys that played the other day to take a step forward put something on film that you can look at and, and and really grade. You got that the other day. Like, and I thought that was the best part was that you got to see guys. Um, you know, I, I thought Kendrick Bingley Jones was a guy who's battled injuries, but when mm-hmm. he was on the field, made some plays. So that's what you got to, you got to be excited about was that you got to see some other dudes making plays. And, and now you got to hope like, yeah, are those dudes going to see the field the next three games? No, probably not. But you you might see those guys in a bowl game if so because you'll you're going to have dudes that enter the transfer portal. You're going to have dudes that are going to go pro. We talk about bowl season. The most important thing now is those 15 practices you get more so than the game itself. It's going to be really big for a lot of those guys you saw on the defensive side of the ball. And, and so that's why you got to like that you, that Carolina didn't you know mess around and have to play their starters deep into the second half. You were able to get your starters off the field early. Um, save them really a game's worth of, of, of hits on their body. And then you got a, a chance to evaluate a bunch of different guys on that side of the ball that are going to play a role for you starting next season. All right, let's talk about the one negative in this game. And that was the coaching decisions that just, I, I mean, just made no sense. Um, clearly the biggest one is the special teams error right before halftime. I, 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 don't, I, I don't really understand what the idea was there. I don't know if it's you're blowing in an opponent out. You know it's an FCS opponent. They shouldn't be able to claw back into the game. Um, I mean, you, you get into field goal range with nine seconds to go. You have plenty of time to get up there, spike the ball, and bring out the field goal unit. You instead decide that you want to try to rush the field goal unit onto the field, which – Okay, you've practiced that plenty of times before. Nine seconds. I mean, it's close, but you can usually get it on. The problem is, is that you rush everybody on except the holder and the kicker who actually have to be the who are the guys that have to execute the actual kick. I I, I just I don't know. That was one of the oddest moments that I have ever seen. And I mean, again, maybe I'm reading into it too much because it's an FCS team and maybe they're trying something. Uh, To me, I do not understand how coaching-wise you, one, don't do the smart thing and spike the ball, and two, how do you not have everybody lined up? Like, that is on Larry Porter. That's on Mac Brown. How do you not have these guys all around one coach on the sideline, everybody is together. All 11 players that are going on the field or however many, if there's somebody that stays on, that's on the offensive line or that is playing tight end, whatever, that's a part of this, the the, the, the uh, kicking unit as well. How do you not have all those guys around the coach ready to go? It's as if everybody on the sideline did not know what the plan was. There were There were people thinking that there were different plans. I mean, that was just – that that was a horrible, horrible moment for Carolina. And I, I could not believe that sitting sitting there watching. Um, you, It's not a team that, that practices that. 
because I, I refuse. How do you to not play. practice that? You have that's look. You are not going to have to use that many times in a season, if ever. That is a play that you need to practice. I mean, I'm not going to say once a practice, but it's got to be at least once a week. You have to practice. Hey, if we get in a situation where we don't have timeouts, we got to run these dudes out there. We have to work on what we are going to do and make sure that everybody is communicating right. That's that's what it seemed like to me. Nobody communicated to uh, Burnett. More than likely what happened, Burnett was probably warming up on the kicking net and wasn't told or he didn't hear whatever and wasn't ready. Someone's got to notice that, hey, Noah and uh, and Cole Maynard, they're not standing near us. Where are they? We need them here. We're trying to execute this play. I, I just – what the hell, man? Yeah, I mean, to me, it just looked like a team that was unprepared to execute whatever they were trying to execute, which comes back to them not doing it enough in practice to feel – comfortable uh doing that like and look not, i mean yeah not, not, nine seconds is is plenty of time like if you have your guys lined up ready to go um i i think about the fewest you they'll tell you is like a seven seconds so you even had really two extra seconds to to mess around with so um i mean luckily you didn't come back to cost you and maybe they were just doing it for um you know poops and giggles because the game was already out of hand but um, at least we know moving forward in that situation, just spike the ball and line up and kick the field goal. Oh, yeah. There's there's no doubt about it. Uh, the other thing coaching-wise here before we move on, talk a little bit about Drake May and the commitment that Carolina received during the game. What did you make of Chip Lindsey's early play calling? I was not a huge fan of the way that they went about it. Yeah, they try to get the ball on Amari and Hampton's hands, but they do it on on some odd jet sweep that I I just I did not get. I, I didn't understand what was going on there. Um, they don't end up using a traditional run on the first drive at all. Have to punt the ball away, three and out. Um, and then on the third drive of the game, after they drive down, score a touchdown, they come back on the third drive of the game, and for some reason, they get into a third and eight situation in Campbell territory, and they decide to basically punt on the drive and run the football on, on third and eight. Pick up two yards, punt the ball back. I, like, I, I did, to me, like, it, it, this is now a trend that's that's becoming a little scary with Chip Lindsey. Um, I didn't think it was an issue in the game against Georgia Tech, but three out of the last four games, Miami, Virginia and now Campbell. I'm I haven't been a huge fan of how he's gone about some of his early game plans. Um and I, I think I, I I to me, like I don't know if that's something that's gonna continue, but it's it's gotta be something that changes starting this weekend against Duke. Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna defend the first series because you said, you know, a non-traditional run play, Drake May took a a pretty bad sack that he, you know, a quarterback his level shouldn't take. I think the first two run plays were honestly them just trying to figure out, can we try this and it work? Like basically they were just experimenting. I don't think the first drive is the time to do it. I don't necessarily agree with it, but a lot of coaches in those types of games that they know is going to be out of hand, you're just kind of going to try new stuff and figure out what works. Um, you know, sometimes it happens in the beginning of the season where you play these types of games for Carolina, their, their experimental game came at the end of the year, which works nicely because you've got three really tough games coming up ahead. So, um, hopefully they learned the hard way. Yep. Let's just hand him the ball off the traditional way. Cause when he does that, he runs for six, seven yards, usually untouched. Um, so that, and then the third and eight. Yeah, I mean, you you would you'd like to see them be aggressive because you've got the quarterback that you've got. I, I think it was just one of those where, for whatever reason, he was just fine with not getting points on that drive, mm -hmm. so he just you know didn't. And again, I don't know if I necessarily agree with it, but against Campbell, you shouldn't have to be chasing points all the time. Like you should be. If there's a, you know if you want to play conservative, you should be able to play conservative and not be a a, a, a really big talking point. All right, let's get to uh, Drake May here really quickly. Uh, he talked to the media on Tuesday. 
Uh, it was, of course, as I mentioned earlier, given the opportunity by Mac Brown to walk with the seniors on senior day and be honored. Here's what the Tar Heel quarterback had to say about whether or not he will take that opportunity and participate on Saturday. I thought about it, and, uh, you know, my time here at Carolina has been awesome. Um, and, you know, uh, All right. Just, uh, I think it's not one day, of you know, here, so, you know, uh, the year. I will. And, uh, just when I think back on it, um, you know, I remember Luke's speech and Dean Bill when he was a senior and how hard felt it was. And just, you know, that feeling of you know, knowing, you know, you're a senior, they won't be back in a different you know, position I'm at. So leave that for the seniors, guys, you know, out there, like Corey Gaynor and uh, some of the other guys. And even said, uh, I'm not sure what said done, but, you know, I assume, you know, it's his fourth year. So, you know, guys that, you know, sweat and tears for, you know, their, their last year. Uh, I think it's meant for those guys. And have them celebrate those, them and then, uh, just, uh, you never know, I've, you know, I haven't made a decision about, you know, what next year is going for. So, uh, just think that's, that's what's best for me. And, and I feel like, you know, you know, that celebration on, on Saturday, um, is meant for, for those guys, you know, for sure playing the last game. I've thought about it and, uh, you know, my time here at Carolina has been awesome. Um, and, you know, uh, just, I think senior day, you know, first. All right. For some reason, I wanted to play a second time there. You, you, you got it in there once, Drake. We get it. Um, so what do you what do you, what do you make of that? Um, really, first of him not of him not choosing to participate in Senior Day. I, I think I think it's a great move by him. I think it's awesome. You know, he says, "Look, let the seniors have their moment." You know, I'm not a senior. I've been here. I've done some great things. That, that's that's awesome. But this is really about them. This is guys that have grinded for four, five, some of them six years uh, at this university. I think that's that's a cool move from him saying, look, let them have their moment because I've seen, you know, how impactful it can be to let them have that. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a nice gesture because he's he's not a senior. And the last time I checked, it's it's called senior day, not uh last year at North Carolina Day. So it, it's it, it's it's a nice gesture by him. Another example that the kid just gets it, like he understands what what that what what Saturday is is going to be about um, for for us to, you know, appreciate those dudes. You know, there is part of us that, yeah, I would like to see him because it's our last time we're going to see him in Keenan Stadium. Like, he's – because he's not going to play another year. So, I'd like for him to be selfish and give us a chance to to go and, 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 and honor him um, because we didn't get to do it on senior day for Sam Howell because he left early. You didn't do it for Mitch Trubisky because he left early. Um, the last guy you really got to do it for was, you know, Marquise Williams uh, from a quarterback perspective. Um, but, you know, it's just a, a cool move by him. Um, you know, he can say as much as he wants he hasn't made up a decision. The NFL is going to make that decision for him because he's going to be a top three NFL draft pick next year. So he, he's, he's, not, he's not coming back to school. Um, he's just because he's got three big games to go, he's doing the right thing and not making it a talking point. He'll make it official after the regular season when he opts to not play in the bowl game to prepare for the NFL draft. So, um, you, you know, uh, I, I didn't take anything out of it because it was really a whole bunch of nothing because I think we all know what's going on here. Yeah, I I, I, I got to be honest. Like in that – with that part, I, that, that was about as – like I know people are wanting to try to make it seem like, okay, maybe there's a chance. And I, I who knows, maybe there is a chance. Like I do, I do truly believe this dude really loves Carolina, but I'm sorry. Like I just, to me, I'm with you. I don't see any way that it's possible. Like this dude is going, as you said, I would be stunned if he does not go top three. And I got to tell you, I think he legitimately has a chance to go number one overall. When you look at, you know, a, what, what some of the experts have said about both him and Caleb Williams, a lot of them have them very close. And I do think that the, the there it is going to play a factor. The, you know, personality of Caleb Williams, a guy that, um, you know, is has, has painted F.U. on his fingernails, uh, all that kind of stuff. There, there's stuff with that. But more so, it, it's really the personality of him saying, like, that during uh, – it was – Early in the season, um, there was a report that came out that he said he wants to be an owner, part owner of the NFL team that drafts him. Never heard that before. Um, to be honest, don't even know if that's legal. I, I, I don't think you can own 
a franchise and be playing in the league at the same time in the NFL. I don't think that's actually something you can do. Um, but it seems like that's something that he and his father want. Um, I, I don't know how that's going to play in NFL locker rooms. So I th- or in NFL front offices, I should say. So I, I mean, look, I think he's got a chance to be the number one overall pick. If that's the case, I think it's like Mac Brown said. Somebody asked Mac the other day, you know, what, what what do you think about Drake? Is this his final game? And he said, it'd be mine. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's that's pretty honest for Mac Brown. Um, it shows that, you know, he, as you said with Drake, he gets it. He understands that, look, if you got the opportunity, I'm not going to try to keep you here. I'm going to tell you to do what's best for you. Um, and I think he'll probably be gone at the end of the season. In terms of not walking on senior day, you said we haven't really been able to honor a quarterback. Technically, we did honor Sam. Remember, Sam did graduate. If you do graduate in the classroom, you're a senior. They did honor him, remember, but he was hurt. It was against Wofford. Remember, he didn't play in that game because he got hurt. Oh, man. I cannot remember who they played the week before. But they chose to sit him out that game, allowed him to play you know, so that he would be a – at full health or close to full health against state. Um, so yeah, technically you got to honor him, but I mean, what he, he didn't even play in the game. Like you, you cheered him in the, in the pregame and then he went to the sidelines and you didn't see him the rest of the day. Um, so that really wasn't honoring a guy. So I, I think this will be a unique opportunity. And I think the way that they can, that they have to do it in this game is look, this is why it's so important to win this game get the ball back late in the game, you take him out of the game, you let him have his moment where he waves to the crowd, put in Connor Harrell, let him take a knee or something like that. That's the way to do it. I I think this is right. Honor these seniors, especially some of the guys that have been here a while, like British Brooks. Like that guy deserves to have his moment. Um, Not saying that Drake would ruin it, but I I think the notion by Drake is, is, is an awesome one. Let those guys have their moment. Uh, no, one, last thing that we'll talk about real quick before we get out of here, Tar Heels do land uh, their 27th and probably final player in the 2024 class. Uh, it is tw- uh, a three-star defensive lineman from the state of Georgia, Leroy Jackson. Uh, he is the number uh, 1,103 overall player in the class, number 115 defensive lineman, 132 player in the state of Georgia. Uh, you know, some good things here. A little bit of versatility uh, that I like about him. Uh, shows some nice athleticism. Like his size. Um, and I, I think one of the things that you like the most about him, uh, at least from my perspective when I turned on his tape, is his ability to shed blocks and get into the backfield. Carolina's defensive linemen have not been great at doing this. And look, you know, he's a guy that's playing at the 6A level in the state of Georgia. Pretty high level of football in that state. But it is going to be a learning curve moving up to the college level. This is really a guy Carolina's taking a flyer on, a guy that, you know, came in to this season on nobody's board. Last year as a junior in his first year on varsity, had just 29 total tackles, three tackles for loss, no sacks. Really quiet year, nondescript player for uh, a a high school in in Georgia. Um, This year, he has had a huge season. They just closed out their regular season, getting ready to go to the playoffs as an 8-2 and football team. Uh, 42 total tackles, 21 tackles for loss, nine sacks, 11 quarterback hurries, and a fumble recovery. So this dude has just taken his his game to a whole new level. I think it's a flyer that Carolina has taken on him. I like it. They needed another guy in that room, especially someone with a little bit more size than you have in Peter Pasansky, who's around 265, a little bit smaller uh, than your typical defensive lineman. So he'll have to put on weight or he'll be a guy that'll move over and probably play off the edge for Carolina. So this is a move that they needed to make. The question I wanted to ask you about this is he commits during the game. This is odd to me. I've never seen this before, ever. I've seen guys that have committed after games, uh, you know, because they were on campus visiting, something like that. He wasn't on campus. He, he was on campus for the Miami game. He had silently committed to Carolina at the Miami game, which makes this even more confusing. But he then waits and has a ceremony on a Saturday morning into afternoon. And for some reason, he ends up committing during the game. I mean, look, I'm not going to hold the kid. I'm not going to say anything super negative, but I just found it real odd that this happens during a game. 
almost kind of taken away a little bit from what Carolina's doing on the field at that time. It was it was just odd to me. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go that far. It was a three-star prospect committing during a FCS game. So, like, I mean, it wasn't like you got, you know, it wasn't like Drake May flipped his, you know, commitment during, you know, the ACC title game. Like, if it was well, something like that's, that. Well, that's one where the staff probably would step in and say, look, you can't do that. You're too big of a prospect. But, I mean, it's just weird. Like, you have to, like, like inside Carolina, I waited admittedly until the next day to put an article up because I wanted to focus on the game. I was at the game. That was also part of it. But inside Carolina, like, putting up an article, and I'm not saying anything against them. I think it was the right – they had to do it. A kid committed. But to see an article mid-game about a guy committing while the team that he's committing to is on the field, the coaches that he's committing to are coaching in a game, to me, it just – it felt a little odd to me. Yeah, but, I mean, we don't know all this – we don't know what all went into it. Like, maybe that was the only Fair time point. his he could have certain people there to to watch him commit. Like, we, we – we don't know. So, I mean, and like I said, it wasn't like he was doing this during a, a, a relatively important game. Like, it was against Campbell. So, like, you know, if, if we can't read about a dude that's committing during an FCS opponent, then we got bigger issues on our hands. So, um, but yeah, you know, I mean, it would have been different like he done it at halftime. Like, it probably wouldn't have been as big a deal because it's at halftime. But, mm-hmm. like I said, we don't know what all went into it. and. I'm not going to criticize a kid that, you know, gets to commit to a college that, you know, I didn't get a chance to commit to because I think if I had a chance to commit to them, I'd have done it whenever I wanted to, to be quite honest, with not 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 planning around their schedule. So mm. Mm. it makes sense for you. Um, no, I mean, you, you, you bring up good points. You don't really know who was able to be there for the announcement maybe they had to be there at that specific time that's that's a really good point so that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the podcast guys make sure you have head over to the website heeltoughblog.com uh check out all the content that we got up there for the campbell game uh we're gonna have the uh, stock portal come out tomorrow uh it's been a really packed week so i had to back that one up just a little bit uh, and then we'll have the preview of the duke game uh that'll come out uh, it'll probably be uh, on Saturday morning for you guys. You guys can take a look at that as uh, Carolina gets prepared for the 8 o'clock primetime kick on ACC Network. Uh, and then uh, we will, of course, have you covered on the back end of that with recap uh, from all of that. Articles up on the website, of course, about Carl Torbush and Leroy Jackson, who we just talked about there just a minute ago that we encourage you guys to check out as well. And uh, an article as well up there about Drake May, uh, everything uh, that uh, he said on Tuesday. Uh, meanwhile, on the basketball side of things, Carolina tipped off the season. Uh, it's, it feels so good to have Carolina basketball back. Uh, Josh had the recap for you uh, on the website of the Radford game. Me and him did take you through the uh, Radford game on the podcast side of things. We'll be doing that all year. Uh, really that that same uh, order just about the entire season. He'll have the articles for you, and then we'll follow it up with an edition of the podcast that you guys can check out. Some of them will be video as well, just like this uh, this, this podcast. So make sure that you guys keep an eye out for that uh, as we go throughout the year. So once again, that wraps it up for this edition of the podcast. want to thank uh, Josh for hosting with me. want to thank you guys for watching and listening. And as always, 